Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Mather at the University of Central Oklahoma, and this is a lecture on conformity. And so, one of the things that's necessary to conformity is that you have to have groups. And so, if you don't have groups, you have nothing to conform to. Uh, groups use two different types of social influence. They use informational social influence, which is where they look to the behavior of others to inform their own behavior. So, informational social influence leads to private acceptance, where you truly believe that that's the correct answer, and that's why you look to others was to get the correct answer. Normative social influence is where people conform because they want to be liked or accepted. And so this leads to public compliance. Uh, you might say, I, yes, I'll go ahead and change my vote to this, but I don't necessarily believe that. Nonconformists are brought into line by a series of actions that go in this order. Teasing from the others, discussion, um, being mean to them, and then ultimately isolation if they don't conform. Uh, usually the pressures of, of uh, um, social influence are enough to make them conform, uh, but if not, eventually it leads to isolation. Social impact theory discussed three different components uh, of, of conformity, and so three different factors that, are, that affect conformity. Uh, one is the strength or the importance of the group. Uh, another is the immediacy or the closeness of the group. Uh, is it a group that you deal with regularly or is it a group that you very rarely see? Uh, that'll influence how much uh, how likely you are to conform. Uh, and then the number of others. Uh, if there's two other people versus three other people versus four, uh, the, uh, the likelihood of conformity levels off at three, uh, which means that as social creatures, we basically treat three the same as 15, uh, three other people as 15. Uh, so we get to the, the maximum point of conformity fairly quickly. Uh, that makes sense because we're a very social species. One of the things that we talked about was we talked about the Solomon Ashes study where they had people around a table and they, they went around the table and, and on critical trials, Confederates um, who worked for the experimenter gave the wrong answers on a task that were obviously wrong. They gave the same wrong answer and because they built up a rapport um, working around the room previously, uh, then people, uh, the, the participant um, conformed on a large number of trials. In those types of studies, conformity in the United States um, with ASH type studies uh, have, has decreased over the past 40 and 50 years. Uh, and so we don't see that same level of conformity. People are more likely to, uh, to dissent um, over what the, the Confederates say with the same wrong answer. Uh, there are gen very small gender differences for conformity. Uh, women are more likely to conform on the ASH test than men, um, but not by a whole lot. And, and the differences go away once the response uh, the differences are only occur if the response is public. If the response is private, then, then, the, then uh, the gender differences go away. One of the things in the ASH study was that there was a history. I mean, the group was new when they came together, but they went through a number of trials first uh, where everybody was on the same page saying the same thing. Uh, and then eventually there was a critical trial where there was the opportunity for the, the person to conform to the wrong answer. And so Hollander in 1960 described what I think is a very intuitive approach to, um, to, to group group dynamics, um, discussed idiosyncrasy credits. And so idiosyncr idiosyncrasy credits are where a group's tolerance for an individual's deviance um, is based on the individual's history of conformity. So essentially, if you're an individual in a group, the more that you've conformed over time, the more leeway that the group will give you when you step outside of the norm and you go against the group on some other issue. And so the more that you've conformed in the past, uh, the more tolerant the group is of your occasional deviance. So basically you kind of build these credits uh, that allow you to step out and be more creative and go against the group and have credibility and not be teased and ultimately isolated from the group. Now the way that you, you are able to change a group if you dissent from what the rest of them say is, is there's um, minority group members, and when I say minority I mean numerical minorities, which should be somewhat self-evident, but if there's one person that thinks the guy is guilty and 11 that thinks the guy is not guilty, uh, that one person is in the minority. And so if you're in the numerical minority, you have to use informational influence to be persuasive, whereas majorities are able to use normative influence. And so if you're in the minority, you've got an uphill battle. You've got to change a whole lot of people's minds. And so you've got to exert high quality arguments. Um, majority members, on the other hand, uh, are able to use normative influence. They're able to say, hey, be cool like us, be accepted like us, just change your vote. Uh, or change your choice. Um, but minority group members don't have that. So minority group members have to use higher quality arguments with the hopes of uh, changing 
private acceptance and getting other members to truly believe that. Um, one of the things we talked about before uh, was we talked about how if you've got one dissenter, that changes the probability that you will conform. And so uh, if you're able to use strong, high-quality arguments to change one person's mind, uh, then that person becomes an ally and it changes the likelihood that you will conform. And so if you're truly in the right and you can use high-quality arguments, you've got to get one person and then that person and you become uh, an allies in trying to convince other people um, to have private acceptance of a, of a strong, high-quality argument. Uh, we can use social influence for bad things, which is usually what people think about, but social influence can be used for good also. It can be used to get people to wash their hands more after, um, after cooking in a kitchen at a restaurant um, and, and uh, things like that. Now, one of the things we have to do with, with social norms is we have to identify what types of norms there are. And there is a difference between injunctive norms, um, which is what we think other people approve or disprove of, uh, such as we believe others think that littering is wrong, that's an injunctive norm, and also descriptive norms. Um, descriptive norms are our perceptions of what people actually do in a situation. Uh, and so, for example, an injunctive norm is that littering is wrong. Um, but a descriptive norm is at baseball games, um, people eat peanuts and crack the shells and, and throw them on the ground and then they'll get swept up later on and everybody does it and that's the descriptive norm of what people are actually doing. Uh, Cialdini um, did a very innovative study with it, uh, where he pitted injunctive norms versus descriptive norms. Uh, and in this study he had participants um, who were returning to their cars at a public library. So he did this study in a, in a parking lot of a public library. And in the control condition, they had confederates that, that walk by and, and either say or do nothing. Uh, they don't say anything, they don't do anything, they just walk past whoever the participant is in the, in the, in the uh, library parking lot. In the descriptive norm condition, uh, the confederate drops a bag of, of fast food on the ground, so they litter. This is communicating that people litter in this situation. That's the descriptive norm. In the injunctive norm condition, the confederate picks up a, li a littered fast food bag that's already on the ground. So this is communicating the, the injunctive norm, littering is wrong. So this occurred in either a littered or a clean parking lot. And so the experimenters um, trashed the parking lot and, or didn't, or picked it all up. Uh, so they manipulated whether the parking lot was littered or clean at the public library. So what you've got is you've now got either a littered or a clean parking lot and you've got somebody either walking by and doing nothing, somebody picking up a piece of trash or somebody dropping a piece of trash in front of a participant. When participants got to their car, there was an advertisement on the windshield. And the advertisement on the windshield of the car um, is something that people will usually don't pay much attention to. They either stuff it in their car and take it home, presumably to throw away, or they crumple it up and throw it on the ground. And so the dependent variable in this study was, did they take the advertisement away? Did they take it into the car, uh, presumably to dispose of it later, um, or did they crumple it up and throw it on the ground? And so what they found was uh, in the control condition, um, so in the control condition, they just walked past somebody in a littered or a clean parking lot. A third of people littered. So a third of people crumpled up that flyer, threw it on the ground, regardless of whether the, the uh, um, parking lot was clean or littered, when they just walked past somebody without them doing anything. In the descriptive condition, and so remember in the descriptive norm condition, the Confederate dropped the bag of trash, which was the descriptive norm of people litter here. In the description, descriptive litter, uh, descriptive norm condition, uh, people littered much less when the parking lot was clean than when the parking lot was dirty. Because when the parking lot was clean, it stood, the behavior stood out and it communicated that people don't do this here. In the injunctive condition, so lit in the injunctive condition, which was somebody picking up a bag of trash, uh, it reduced littering because it communicated the message that littering is wrong. So I walk past somebody, I see them pick up a piece of trash, it makes the injunctive norm salient or important to me. Uh, then I walk back to my car, I find the flyer, I take the flyer and I put it inside my car because I have, I have been communicated the injunctive norm of people don't litter here. People don't like littering at all. Uh, this occurred regardless of whether the parking lot was clean or, or dirty, so it was the injunctive norm uh, that was activated. So what this demonstrated was that injunctive norms are more powerful than descriptive norms. One of the classic studies that you've probably heard about um, was Stanley Milgram's obedience study. Uh, and he did this and published it in 1963. And so 
he had people come in and, and they were randomly assigned to be a teacher or a learner. And so you walk in, you meet another participant, you talk to them, you say hi, a participant kind of mentions he's got a heart condition, no big deal, you just kind of keep going about your, your, your discussion. Then you draw straws to figure out who's going to be the teacher and who's going to be the learner in the experiment. You don't think a whole lot about this, you don't realize that, this, that the drawing is rigged and that the other person is a confederate who works for the experiment. So when, you're, when they're doing this, they then get separated and the, the, the other participant who you think very easily could have been in the same role you're going to be in goes into the other room, sits down, uh, and you're communicating now through an intercom. And they're the learner, you're the teacher as the participant, and your job is to call out a word. If they get, if they, if they get the task correct, then you shock them. Uh, if they get it incorrect, uh, then you, uh, um, or if they get it correct, you don't do anything. If they get it incorrect, you shock them. Uh, and then you elevate the level of shock each time they get it wrong. So you've got this big contraption that goes from zero to 450 uh, volts. Uh, it's marked with triple X death on one end of it or, or lethal and uh, the other end it's, it's harmless. You go up in increments of 15 volts. Uh, and um, they had interviewed 40, uh, Milgram interviewed 40 psychiatrists before they ran the study. Uh, and the psychiatrist thought that most of the teachers would disobey after 150 volts at the most. Uh, the, the 40 psychiatrists believed that only 1% of people would go to 450 volts, which is where you think that you're shocking somebody with enough to kill them. So they found that in the, in the study, every participant um, administered at least one shock. So every participant was willing to shock another human being just because they were told to do that. Two-thirds of the people went all the way to the end. So two-thirds of the people in the study went all the way to the end. And while they were doing this, as they were increasing their voltage, the other person on the other end started pleading with them, please stop, please stop. I remember I've got a heart condition. I can't take any more of this. And most of the time it only required the experimenter, experimenter prompting them with, the experiment requires that you continue. Uh, and, uh, or sometimes the experimenter said, I'll take responsibility for this, uh, flip the switch and continue. So most of the time that was enough prompting to get two thirds of people to go all the way to the end. And towards the end, the person just scream on the other end just screams uh, and there's just silence and if you watch the video of these people then they continue to read read the words to them there's no sound on the other end flip another switch read another word flip another switch no response on the other end just keep going now now the participants didn't enjoy this it wasn't like they were just sitting there flipping switches having fun they would get up they would sweat they would pace they would laugh maniacally they would argue with the experimenter but two-thirds of them eventually sat back down in the chair and went back to flipping switches. And so this was a very powerful um, demonstration of obedience to authority. Um, the, uh, so they started looking, Milgram started looking into it and said, okay, so what could have caused this? And, and initially Milgram was interested in, in Nazi Germany. He was interested in, in um, how what he believed very good people could conform um, to very horrific orders that they had been given. And so, they, so Milgram thought, well, maybe in this initial study, because I brought them into Yale University, and these are people from the community, not college students, they brought people from the community in. Um, they come into Yale University, they see a guy in a lab coat, a scientist telling them they have to keep doing this. Maybe there was just too much authority there. So they did the study again in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where they rented out an old office building and had people come in. Um, they found the same thing. Uh, they found 65% of people, which was two-thirds in the initial study, went all the way to 450 volts. Only 47.5% went all the way to 450 volts uh, in the study that was done in the office building. However, when they ran the numbers, it was, it was not a significant difference between those two, but it was less. Um, but again, it was not statistically significant. So you still have a very large number of people who are willing to go all the way to the end and believe that they killed somebody. Um, they found no gender doom, uh, difference um, when they did this um, with humans as the, as the uh, person on the other end that you're shocking. Uh, the reason I mentioned that with, is, is humans, and of course part of the, the thought process was, well, women aren't going to do this, men are. And they found no gender differences um, um, when they used humans as the confederate. Um, but Sheridan and King did a study, uh, I believe it was in Australia, and instead of a, a confederate, um, person who's on the other end saying they have a heart condition all this, they have a puppy on the other end. And puppies can't lie to you, right? Puppies, they're on the other end of this thing. 
they can't lie to you. So they can't pretend like they've, they've heard anything uh, or not heard anything, can do anything, can't do anything. They, they're puppies. And they respond to real shocks. And so they set the same study up and labeled it from 0 to 450 volts and actually shocked the puppies. And the puppies scream when you shock them. And they scream and they whimper. And it's awful. And it wasn't actually 450 volts. So the, the, the voltage only increased a little bit and then it leveled off at a, low enough to make the puppies scream but not hurt the puppies. So it wasn't actually, it wasn't harmful at the, at the high levels of, of shocking. But people believe that and they believe they're doing this as they're watching these puppies screams and they flip the, shot, the switch. So same, this is the same Milgram study essentially just with puppies who were actually screaming in front of you. 54% uh, of the males went all the way to 450 volts thinking that they could be killing these puppies. 54% of males still went all the way. Uh, and so, of course, your question is probably, well, how many of the females went all the way? 100% of the females went all the way. Uh, females were much more likely to conform than males, much more likely to think they were going to kill a puppy for science uh, than males were. Um, however, they didn't like it. There were lots of tears. There was lots of crying. Uh, everybody was distressed by it. Um, but they did, in fact, 100% um, of females went all the way and, and, and conformed to the norms that were created by the experimental situation. Now, they found that this is, is consistent across time. That was a fairly recent study. I don't remember within the last 10 years that they did the, the, the study for, in Australia with the puppies. Um, but the, the, the Milgram conformity study has been replicated a number of times across cultures, across time. You find the same effect. And pretty much nothing the victim says or does affects this, this basic effect of the original Milgram study. What they do find is that people are more likely to disobey when the experimenter leaves the room. So I tell you to keep flipping the switches, keep doing this. I leave the room. Uh, and now somebody says, oh, please stop. I can't take any more of this. Then people are less likely to continue on. Uh, when the victim is in the room and you have to physically place the electrodes on them and shock them, um, people are less likely to continue on with the study. So if you have to, so there's more likely to, they're more likely to have disobedience and not continuing the study if you have to be the one to put the electrodes on them and shock them and watch these bad things happen to them. Now remember, there were no real shocks in the Milgram studies. Now in the puppy study there were, but in the other studies there were no real shocks administered. Uh, it was all just they believed they're flipping the switch and there's a reaction on the other end. Uh, if you've got two experimenters that are arguing and one of them says yes, they have to keep going, and the other one says no, they can't, they're going to kill this guy. Um, Nobody, nobody continues on. Everybody disobeys, and they defer to the guy, or they defer to the experimenter who says, um, "You're going to kill this person. Stop!" And they don't follow the instructions of the other one that says, "Keep going." Um, if the person that's ordering them appears to be a volunteer, so in some versions of the Milgram study, they brought in a third person, and this third person was also a participant, and they drew straws to figure out which roles people would be in. And, of course, the, the real participant ends up being the teacher, and one of the confederates is the learner, and one of them is the, um, the other volunteer who is recording reaction times until the experimenter leaves the room. And then they become the one that says, no, no, you have to keep going, whenever the other person uh, is screaming, saying, please stop. Um, people disobey when it appears to be another participant who's telling them to keep going. Um, also, if they're working in kind of almost what's kind of a call center um, environment where you've got um, other people around you doing the same types of tasks and you see them not continuing on, then, pe then people disobey when they believe that they're going to, to harm or kill their person. Uh, they don't continue on. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of the ethics uh, of uh, the ethics of the Milgram study. Uh, and, uh, there have been ways to do it more recently. In Australia, they're not subject to the same ethical rules we have, uh, and, but it's not inherently unethical depending on how you do it or how far you go. Uh, and I'll talk about a, a more recent replication of the study um, that did pass IRB approval in the United States uh, in a minute. Uh, one of the reasons this effect occurs is, is there, there's this escalation of commitment. You know, I, I flipped the 15 volt slip switch, so why not flip the 45 volt switch? Why not flip the 60 volt switch? I've flipped the 150 volt switch, so why not flip the 165 volt switch? I flipped the 375 you know, volt switch, so why not flip the next one? Uh, and so because of the increments of 15 volts, there's this escalation of commitment where you 
put this much into it, so why would I stop right here? Um, and so there's this self-justification where you've made the initial commitment uh, and, you, and you've escalated in small increments um, and this, you feel like you have to justify your effort that you've put into it, right? And that goes back to the cognitive dissonance reduction uh, that we've discussed in, in a previous lecture. There's also a loss of personal responsibility. And so as soon as the participant invests the responsibility in the authority, well, the, the scientist is the one that, that's in control of what's going on. They're the authority, they're responsible for this. So if something happens to this guy, it's not my fault, I was doing what I was told, um, which obviously can lead to some terrible things. Uh, Zimbardo is a kind of example of investing the authority in that. Zimbardo in 2005, uh, examined uh, execution guards and, and how much responsibility they view for killing a prisoner. Uh, and he found that they, view, they don't view themselves as killing prisoners, they view as, as part of uh, them just doing their job. Uh, they didn't make the decision to commit the crime, they didn't sentence the person to death, uh, they're just the person flipping the switch and that's their job. One of the things that they have uncovered with all of this is it's not really aggression. And so people aren't doing this to be mean to other people in the Milgram task. In fact, as I mentioned, they were extremely distressed. Uh, only two and a half percent of people um, used the full shock when they got to choose which shocks they use. So most people, if you get to choose which ones you use and you don't have to go up 15 volts every time, then most people stay at the bottom end and they don't mess around very, they don't go very high. Um, However, I said only 2.5% of people used the 450 volt shocks when they didn't have to. 2.5% of people used the 450 volt shocks when they didn't have to, right? There's 2.5% of the people that are walking around out on the street that you should be terrified of because they're willing to just hook you up to a machine and flip a switch at 450 volts and kill you for basically no reason. So you need to worry about that 2.5% of people that are willing to do that. It is a small percentage, but that's terrifying. Uh, in 2009, uh, Jerry Berger uh, in, at the University of California, um, Santa Clara, or University of California, Santa Barbara, I can't remember which one. Um, but Jerry Berger replicated the Milgram study. And what he had found in, in the original study was that if people went to 150 volts, then they continued on to 450 volts. So they were very likely to continue on. So 150 volts became kind of the magic number of distress. So they made 150 volts the top range that people could go to in the study. So the machine was still labeled to 450 volts. Everything else happened exactly the same as it had in the initial study, except they didn't get to the point where people thought they killed somebody. When they got to 150 volts, because in the other studies that had been predictive uh, of whether or not they would go to 150 volts, the IRB said that they had to stop at 150 volts, Institutional Review Board said that they had to stop at 150 volts because that is predictive of where they would have gone to 450 volts without inducing the extra stress on them that at that point would be unnecessary. Uh, they also screened out participants that had taken more than um, two psychology classes or that were at all familiar with Milgram studies so that they had people that were unfamiliar with, with Milgram studies in this task. Um, that's important because of how famous the Milgram study is. Uh, it was important to have people that hadn't, hadn't been through that before. They also had clinical psychologists interview potential subjects so that they, they believe that they would be able to um, um, withstand the psychological trauma that may come from at least getting to the 150 volts um, portion of the study. And so we've talked about roles and how roles are important. Uh, we've talked about norms and how they're important. Um, we have to have a certain amount of compliance for a group to function. And so I mentioned that people don't comply um, to groups if there's, that people don't comply to themselves, right? You have to have a group. Uh, within groups you have roles, and all of this is necessary to make a group function effectively. People do have to value the authority-subordinate relationship uh, and obey authority for groups to work effectively. So some of the factors that cause people to obey when they don't want to, uh, one of them is investing the authority with the responsibility, which allows people to absolve themselves of accountability. Uh, another one is what's called routinization or making something routine. And so as the duties and responsibilities that a person is in charge of for in a particular role become routine or become normalized, uh, there becomes little opportunity for them to step up as a conscientious objector. Again, that goes back to sunk costs, it goes back to escalation of commitment and how much you've put into it. 
And so there, it becomes difficult to say, well, I've done this before all these times. You know, I don't want to do it again. Also, the, the rules of good manners um, protect the feelings that we have in relationships. And so people don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to become isolated. And so they would prefer to um, just continue on um, with the way things have been done rather than standing up and saying, hey, I don't like what you're doing or I refuse to do that. Uh, another one, as we mentioned previously, is entrapment. And so the escalation of commitment um, justifies the, the uh, leads to the justification of the investment. Um, so again, they, they very carefully set that up to where they didn't have um, zero vo volts to 450. You know, they didn't have two switches, zero volts and 450 volts. And then you flip the 450 volt switch and, you know, zero to 450. They've got, they didn't have zero 150, 300, 450. They had 15 volt increments all the way from zero to 450. So you flipped more switches by the time you get to one of these. So it makes it more likely that you will go ahead and decide to continue on and flip to the other. And so conformity is, is extremely important to us. We can't function as a society without a certain level of conformity. Um, but we've also talked about all the times where conformity can lead us astray. And so it's important uh, for you to recognize the processes that are, that are in play in your life as you make your decisions and so that you can understand conformity and how to get other people to conform when it's appropriate and how to conform when it's appropriate and how to not be um, led astray by an uninformed expert um, who everybody is following and you've got informational social influence, uh, at which point you could have disastrous results. And so the key here is to understand how the processes of conformity work and then to apply those as you need to as they fit with your goals and your values in your life. Uh, I can't tell you how to use this information. All I can tell you is, is uh, um, how the processes work. So uh, that concludes our conformity lecture uh, and thank you very much.